What is the, the current situation about COVID-19 here in Nova Scotia and in Shetty Camp? What's, what's kind of alarming the physicians here in Shetty Camp is, um, you know, the message, the message is the same. Uh, and the message is we need to be isolating ourselves. You know, um, the fact is if, if everyone just uh, stayed away from everybody else for two weeks, th- this would be over with, right? It'd be simple as that. This virus just couldn't be able to spread and it, it would be gone. Um, obviously, we can't do that. Um, but we can certainly make an effort to try to minimize the spread. The concern is, you know, in Nova Scotia, COVID-19 is throughout Nova Scotia now. So there's no parts that do not have cases. And we have to assume it's everywhere in the province. In fact, people have to assume that they have had it. You know, they, people have to act as if they're potentially infected. Uh, and it's only if we do that that we can make a difference. Um, you know, we, we, we think we're really at a tipping point here. Uh, you know, we now know that there is a case in Nova Scotia that was not related to travel. And so we call this community spread, meaning we don't know where this individual contracted the virus. And now this virus is getting out into the community. And that is concerning because once that happens, then the potential for our healthcare system to be overwhelmed is there. Um, so when we talk about community spread, that means we don't know how this person uh, got the virus and who did they give it to. And the potential of this being not contained anymore is a lot higher. So people have to understand that we have the potential to really slow this down um, and minimize the effect on our hospitals and on our population. But we also have the potential to be easily overwhelmed. Um, some numbers that I've you know, been hearing from other specialists is that they're expecting about a 30% infection rate. Um, and that's a, that's a possibly good case scenario. Okay? Some countries have higher. Even with 30% infection rate, um, so our hospital serves 10,000 people, that means 3,000 people are going to be infected. Okay? The problem is a lot of people that are infected are asymptomatic. They have no symptoms. They don't know. They, have, they don't have a fever. They don't have a cough. But they can still pass it on to somebody else. We do know, however, that of the people that are infected, about 10% get so sick that they have to come into hospital. That's 300 people. Again, our hospital has 10 regular beds. We have a few outpatient beds. We have a call room. You know, the doctors and the nurses... And the facility managers were planning on, you know, what, what can we do if we start to get 10 people, 20 people, 30 people? Um, and and the, the potential scenarios are grim, you know. Um, what struck me as a physician, if you watch the news, um, in Spain, um, they've run out of hospital beds. And what they're doing for people that are too sick to be home is they are taping off rectangles uh, in the hallway and, and patients are being lying down in these rectangles with a pillow, maybe, and a blanket, um, and people are checking on them. I mean, that's, that's the level of care. The hospital system is being overwhelmed. We don't want to get to that point here in Nova Scotia. Okay? We have a good hospital system, but we can't deal with hundreds and thousands of infected COVID-19 patients. So we need people to stay at home. It's a simple message but we need people to take it very seriously, okay? Um, It's as simple as, you know, staying home. One person in the household should be the one person that goes out once a week to get some groceries, once a week to check the mail. Um, If you need gas, one person, there should be only one person going out and really minimizing the time out of the house. So no one can come over and play cards. Um, You know, your aunt and uncle can't come over for supper. You you can't visit your grandchildren. You know, you need to stay at home and the people in your home need to stay in their home. And we need to make big barriers between everyone's house. I know this sounds very extreme, very drastic, and it is. But it is the tool that we have to stop our healthcare system from being overwhelmed. What are the plans if these 10 beds were to be taken? Um, If we had, um, you know, currently if if someone came in and they were very sick and had COVID-19, 
We have a unit um, in the Cape Breton Regional Hospital that is set up to accept COVID-19 patients. That's what would happen today. Um, in a week or in two weeks, um, that unit may be full. If that unit is full, we can't send anybody out. So they're going to stay here in Shetty Camp. We'll try to care for them the best that we can. If, um, you know, we're in unchartered uh, waters, um, <clears throat> are we going to put two people in one bed? Um, are we going to have a call out for mattresses to put people on the floor? Um, you know, that, that's the potential scenario if we get uh, 3,000 people infected and 10% of them get so sick that they need hospital care. We only have so much oxygen and tubing and masks and things like that. So the potential is that people would maybe have no care given to them. So again, that is why the physicians in Shetty Camp are saying to people that they need to understand that for two, three, six, eight, ten weeks, you know, we need to have strict, strict isolation. And we all need to change how we do things. You're moving people to the Cape Breton Regional Hospital. Is there any other hospitals or just that's the one? Um, here in Cape Breton, at the moment, the only COVID-19 floor is at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital. We haven't moved anybody there yet, and we haven't had to, um, and, um, and we hope that we don't. Um, but there is a floor set up in, in Sydney. Um, the, the current scenario is that if people got sick, uh, they would be maintained here. If they were proven positive to be COVID-19, they would be transferred to Sydney because we want to keep those patients together. Um, you know, the hospital is preparing. Um, the staff, the medical and nursing staff are preparing. We're doing mock code situations. We're, uh, we're learning about new ways to protect ourselves. If we have to use certain equipment to, to help people breathe, if we had to intubate patients. And we're also talking and we're dealing with some ethical questions. You know, there may be some patients that we don't treat. And, uh, you know, if, there, if we know that older people that co get COVID-19 or people with predisposing medical conditions that already have health concerns, they, they just do not do, they do not survive COVID-19. Uh, so we are not going to put our staff in danger trying to aggressively treat someone who we know will not survive. Because if our staff get infected, then they're no good. If I get infected and can't work in the hospital, if Dr. Sonia gets infected and we're down to one doctor, um, uh, then, uh, then the healthcare system is really, really strained. Again, coming back, I don't want to worry people. Uh, I want to reassure people that we can control this, but we're not going to be the ones controlling it. It is the, the people of, of Shetty Camp and Marguerite and, and the surrounding areas that need to take this isolation, uh, the call from the Prime Minister and from the Premier, they need to take this very seriously. Um, you know, we are lucky, um, we have a bit of a crystal ball. We see what's happening in other countries. We see what's happening in other states in the United States. We do not want to get there. And if people stay home and protect themselves, their house has to be considered like a castle. And, and if they're in their castle, they're going to be safe. But if they leave their castle, they need to make sure it's for only essential purposes. And then they need to wash their hands properly, um, come back home and make sure that they're not going to spread the virus to anybody else at home. There have been rumors that kids are not as touched by, by COVID-19. Could you tell me more about that? Luckily, the science has certainly shown that um, children um, and adolescents seem to have a better response to COVID-19. <clears throat> and uh, certainly there's, it's very rare to have a very sick or fit fatality in a young person from COVID-19. It's not impossible. There's certainly, it, it's not impossible. But, you know, what we are learning about this virus is um, if you have a good immune system, a good immune system can handle this virus. So most kids have great immune systems. Most kids, um, you know, they're young, they've got kidneys are working well, they've got a good liver, their, their immune system is working great. So that's probably why kids don't have as certainly as a concerning uh, symptoms with this virus. That means everybody has to do what they can to boost their immune system. Um, getting the proper amount of sleep, eating well, getting out for some walks, respecting social isolation, 
Um, and that brings me to another point of, I see people going out for walks, which is wonderful, um, but you've got to be six feet away and you're going to go out walking with your neighbor. Um, even if you're outside, we, we, people have to be six feet apart. People may ask, why? What's so special about six feet? This virus is actually what we call a heavy virus. So if someone coughs and it comes out, it can't travel more than six feet. It will fall down. It will fall down to the ground or on a surface around you. So if you're more than six feet away from somebody, right there, you've, you've really protected yourself. Um, and then you have to protect yourself when you're touching things outside, making sure that you're, this virus as well doesn't stick to our hands very well. Soap and water, and it, it, this virus is very slippery. It, it washes off of our hands. So we're lucky that this is a virus that um, if we're six feet away, hard to transmit. If it gets on our hands, if we don't touch our face, if we wash our hands, it, it won't get into our body. Um, and so there are some things, there are, this virus has some vulnerabilities, but it also spreads easily if we don't do what we need to do. I wanted to ask about community related cases. We have one already in Nova Scotia. Do you think there will be any more than that? So, so I didn't get the numbers yet today. <clears throat> I know yesterday that we have climbed over 50 cases and one spread of community spread. Uh, I will expect those numbers to go up. People have to react as if they are infected. If, if they look at themselves and say, I think I may be infected. There was a very interesting study just done in, in Iceland, and they've tested a lot of people in Iceland. Half of the people that were positive in Iceland had no symptoms, asymptomatic. They didn't even know that they had the virus. They had no fever, no cough, no symptoms whatsoever. So we have to act. Even if you're feeling fine, you have to think, I may have the virus and I could potentially spread that to somebody else. So that's how we have to act. Here in Nova Scotia, the numbers are gonna go up. We're at a tipping point. We have the ability to really slow this virus down, flatten that curve, and, and our hospital system can help the people that do get sick. But we are worried that if we don't take this social isolation seriously, um, that, that it will get out of hand. One question I got online. If somebody's traveling from outside the province, one person in the household. So they're gonna be in isolation for 14 days. Do other people in the household need to isolate as well? So, you know, the, 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 there's no clear answer on that from public health. The, uh, the, my understanding is that the person who's come back to the province has to self-isolate for two weeks at home, cannot leave. If there are other people in the household Ideally, they shouldn't leave the household either because there is a potential for spread. So yes, the, 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 the quick answer is if you don't need to leave, don't, okay? If, if someone else in the household has no symptoms and does need, if they are working in an essential job and they're having no symptoms, at the moment, it, I, I think it's certainly reasonable. But one has to ask themselves, is, there, is, there, is that need there to leave the house? If not, I would recommend the whole family stay isolated. Do you have any recommendations for essential workers on how they should take care of themselves? Well, as I talked about, keeping your immune system well. So sleeping, getting your sleep in, um, eating well, making sure you get some time for exercise. The other important thing is, is mental health. And, you know, we already know this has been difficult for, for many people, adults and children at home. Um, and it's not going to get easier as another week, another two, three, four or more weeks go by. So we need people to be reaching out by phone, by Facebook, by FaceTime, um, by Skype, really keeping in touch with other people, letting other people know that, you know, you want to know how they're doing. Um, you know, we're lucky we have technology that even though we're isolated at home, um, we can connect with other people. That's an important part of our health as well. Anything that you like to add? Anything I'd like to add. I guess, you know, again, I, I don't want people, I, I want people to be reassured that we are doing well. You know, when I drive into work, uh, change into a new set of scrubs so that I don't take these clothes back home, um, that, you know, when I'm driving in, I see um, that we are doing very well as a community. But we still know we are hearing about people that aren't really understanding the need for strict social isolation because that's the tool that we have against this virus so it takes you know it just takes one match to start a fire 
Um, so it takes one person who doesn't understand or respect the fact that they may be spreading it and putting other people in danger. So we need all hands on deck. We need everyone understanding that if we do our part, we are going to, we're going to survive this and we are going to do well and we will be able to help the people that do get sick. But as I said, we're at a tipping point. And so if people don't respect that, then we could be in a scenario where um, the people in our area um, uh, may not have resources to help them. And, uh, and so people need to do their part.